This is Kick-Ass News. I'm Ben Mathis. Hey folks, Ben Mathis here. The holidays are upon us, and it's about time to start buying gifts. If you're smart like me, you'll skip the madness of the stores and do most of your shopping on Amazon this year. And if you're going to be doing that anyway, then help support the show by going to the sponsor page on our website at kickassnews.com and copying and pasting the Amazon link there into your web browser before you start ordering. Then Amazon will toss us a little something for every purchase you make this holiday season. You have to shop for gifts anyways. They've got just about everything you can imagine on Amazon delivered right to your door. It won't cost you anything extra, and you can help support the show. So it's kind of like giving two gifts for the price of one this year. And that, my friends, is what you call a Christmas miracle. So again, go to the sponsor page at kickassnews.com and copy our Amazon link into your web browser before you start shopping. And if you feel extra generous this Christmas, then make a donation to keep us going over here at gofundme.com slash kickassnews. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the podcast. And we've just gotten word, you know, it's, 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 it's Boston Marathon Day. And we've just gotten word of not one but two explosions near the finish line of the Boston Marathon. These are live pictures coming into us now. Uh, Maria Stefanos is reporting that she saw the smoke of the finish line as it happened. Uh, race officials have shut it down. It's the sound of two booms, which witnesses said sounded like thunder. This is video that a photographer shot that has not been edited. And uh, we, got, we got a rough situation here. And it, it, this is not a time to jump to any conclusions at all. Uh, we, we, knew, we knew it was Boston Marathon Day and a beautiful day in the Northeast with the temperatures low, but no one certainly expected to see anything like this. Our April 15th, 2013 was a beautiful spring day in Boston, Massachusetts. As they had been doing since 1897, Bostonians gathered on the sidewalks of Boylston Street to celebrate the race that's an official holiday in the city and show some Boston hospitality to the runners who come every year from all over the world to run in the marathon. Then, nearly three hours after the winners crossed the finish line, two explosions occurred 200 yards apart, killing three spectators and injuring 264 people. The bombing, its aftermath, and the stories of some of the survivors are the subject of an emotional new documentary called Marathon, The Patriots' Day Bombing, which airs on HBO tonight, Monday, November 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern. And today, I'm talking with the Emmy-nominated filmmakers behind Marathon, Ricky Stern and Annie Sundberg. They've written, directed, and produced documentaries that have included Joan Rivers' A Piece of Work, which premiered at the 2010 Sundance Film Festival, where it won the U.S. Documentary Prize for Best Editing, the 2007 Emmy-nominated documentary The Trials of Daryl Hunt, the 2008 Emmy-nominated documentary feature The Devil Came on Horseback, and in 2011 their baseball documentary Knuckleball, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and then broadcast on Showtime, and Burma Soldier, which premiered on HBO also in 2011 and earned them another Emmy nomination. They've been recognized with the Best Female Filmmakers Award at the San Diego Film Festival, the Adrian Shelley Excellence in Filmmaking Award, and the Lena Sharp Women in Cinema Persistence of Vision Award by the Seattle International Film Festival. Today, they'll discuss the Boston Marathon bombing, the two brothers who perpetrated this horrific crime, and the victims they left behind. They'll talk about the tip from Russian security services that put the Sarnayev brothers on the FBI's radar but failed to prevent the bombings. They'll discuss the investigation, the manhunt, and the subsequent trial that ended with Zokar Sarnayev receiving the death penalty in a non-death penalty state, and how opinions about that verdict differ among the survivors. We'll discuss the long road to recovery, the tight-knit bond among the injured victims of the bombing, 
how military doctors and wounded warriors have come to the aid of the survivors, and some of the remarkable advances in prosthetics that are helping them regain their mobility. When I talk with documentary filmmakers Ricky Stern and Annie Sundberg in just a moment. Today I'm talking with Emmy-nominated writers, directors, and producers Ricky Stern and Annie Sundberg, who have a new documentary called Marathon, The Patriots' Day Bombing, which airs on HBO tonight, Monday, November 21st, at 8 p.m. Eastern. Ricky and Annie, thanks for calling in. Thank you so much. I didn't realize this, but apparently the Boston Marathon is the oldest marathon in the country. Now, I've never gone to the Boston Marathon, so tell me, what is the atmosphere like at this event? So the Boston Marathon takes place on a Monday in April. It's Patriots Day. It's a national, it's a holiday in, in Boston. The schools are closed. Um, people, uh, it's an international event, and because it's a very competitive race and, and you have to qualify to run in the Boston Marathon or you have to run and raise money for charity. So um, people travel from all over to run the Boston Marathon. And, and it's also the day that the Boston uh, Red Sox have um, a home game in the morning. So it's really a full day of people being in the streets uh, celebrating, they go to the Red Sox game, and then they walk over and they watch the marathon. And it's considered really one of the best days to be in Boston by by people, um, not just even who live there, but really uh, it welcomes. It's when they 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 welcome their arms well, with open arms to the rest of the world. Yeah, and it seems that the two bombs that were detonated were placed in such a way as to target the fans and the onlookers on the sidelines more than the actual runners, right? Absolutely. Um, what happened that day when the bombers made um, their decision to place the backpacks where they did is they were really targeting the crowds. If you look at the timing, the bombs went off at 2.49 p.m., and that's when the um, non-elite runners are coming in, the, the runners who are, you know, your friend, your sister, mm -hmm. your brother. So there were tremendous numbers of families that had gathered to cheer on, you know, their loved ones. And the purpose of placing those bombs there was a densely packed sidewalk, and the, the possibility for collateral, collateral damage was significant. And I, I think how many injuries were there? 200-something? There were 263 people injured that day at the marathon. There were 264 total, um, including the fatality of sh when Sean Collier, the MIT officer, was killed a few days later. There were 90 people who were, uh, their injuries were so critical that they could have bled out or died at the finish line. It was, in some ways, eerie good fortune that this happened where there was immediate access to medical tents, to medical personnel, and they were within... A close driving radius of seven of the top medical facilities in the country. The hospitals are all right there ringing that area of Boston. Well, as one might expect at a major event like the Boston Marathon, you had a lot of iPhones there. Apparently the FBI had 70 terabytes of digital media to sift through in the aftermath. The film also talks about the fact that the facial recognition software they had didn't really work very well because there were too many faces to go through. So what was the break in this case that led investigators to the Sarnayev brothers? You see in the film that they were able to collect a lot of photographs and video surveillance. Um, people sent in iPhone video and photographs, and they, the FBI basically set up viewing centers with their, with their agents and went through it uh, hand, you know, man with their own manpower until they were able to locate uh, the image of one of the bombers, one of the brothers, uh, and could note that he came in with a backpack and he laid the backpack on the ground. And when the first bomb goes off, he sort of moves away from the backpack and then the second backpack is detonated. And they were able to then pull back and see that he was with 
another person with a backpack that they find out later is that they're brothers who did this. Um, and it was from those photographs that were wildly released uh, several days after the bombing that um, they, the, this manhunt began, but it was that the, and the brothers sort of, they, they uh, went to, um, to leave Boston to get to, to uh, New York City. Yeah, they were on their way to New York City. They hijacked a car and um, it, they were pursued and that's how they were tracked down. I mean, I think what was, what was remarkable is we don't include this in the film because it ends up, it's not really the focus of our film but there was a period of time after the photographs have been released where there were, you know, people who had gone to UMass at Dartmouth, the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth campus, with Jahar Sarnayev, the younger brother, and they all sort of scratched their head because people started saying, well, that looks a lot like Jahar. Hmm. Um, but Jahar, you know, in the days between the bombing and their decision to take off once those photographs went live, he was living life as a college student again. He'd gone to the gym. He, you know, he was back in his dorm room. And it's... Uh, Everything happened very quickly after the photographs were released to the public. Yeah, and would they be considered homegrown terrorists? I mean, I think part of it is the definition of terrorism. I think what mm -hmm. happened was these were two people who, and ultimately, you know, Jahar Sarnayev was convicted in a criminal court of a criminal act. Um, I think that he made his statement in the boat of what he felt at that time was guiding him. But there was tremendous amounts of journalistic efforts placed on, you know, trying to understand who these kids were, where they were from, if they had any larger connections to other cells. And ultimately they found that they were really standing alone, acting on their own, informed by their own agendas and beliefs. I was surprised to learn that Russia had already put the Sarnayev brothers on the FBI's radar, but I guess it didn't send up any red flags. So how did they slip past us? Well, it was unactionable intelligence. I mean, I think that they had had, it was sort of low level intelligence. They had a name, you know, that had been, he had traveled to certain areas, but they basically, you know, we do live in a country that unless you've actually done something, they can't really, you can't be subject to subpoenas. Um, and I think that they were looking, they were looking very closely at it for a period, but they didn't find anything that was potentially actionable. So they, they let it go. Yeah. And the FBI say, say in the film that they were tipped off or they were asked for any kinds of um, information on the brothers, and um, all they was very low-level information, and that's all that they have within their rights to pursue. And um, so they weren't pursued further. Well, the documentary is as much about the victims and their struggle to get their lives back as it is about the bombing and the manhunt. You had three deaths but 264 injuries, the two bombs that they made had metal shrapnel, nails, ball bearings, and the victims talk about having such complex injuries that they were in surgery almost every day. And it seems that these bombs were designed as much, if not more, to injure people than to kill them. I, I think that they were um, designed to inflict as much pain and trauma as they could. Um, and so, uh, while the bombs themselves, uh, you know, the, the, imp the, the, the impact they had was that they, they were packed with nails and BBs. And so uh, many people were injured, severely injured. And because of where they were placed low to the ground, um, the amputations that people suffered were mostly to their legs. For people who have never been through the kind of injuries these survivors are dealing with, we tend to assume that they get fitted with a prosthetic, they do a little bit of physical therapy, and just walk away. But there's so much more to overcome when you're talking about dealing with such complex physical injuries, to say nothing of the psychological toll. Talk about the complications these survivors have been dealing with in the three years since the bombing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we feel very much that the film is the survivor's stories, that while we have the backdrop and the context of the pursuit and the capture of the bomber, the bombers and um, the trial and the conviction, it's, it's very much told from the point of view of the survivor families that we focus on. And, you know, there are, are the physical injuries. So of the three families, there, there are each one of them has um, someone who has an amputation, uh, but 
that really was important for us not just to focus on the visible wounds, but the, mm. also the invisible scars, because you, you too often, we, we don't talk about that, how the long-term implications of this, uh, an attack like this in PTSD or, um, you know, this, this sense of uh, uh, other kinds of injuries that you don't necessarily see. So, you know, the survivors are really still struggling. Um, uh, again, I think we in the, you see in the media like a, a year out, some anniversary of a terrorist attack, and there's a sense of wanting to feel good that these people have moved on, they've grown stronger, and we can all feel good about it. But the reality is, it takes a long time. Their lives will forever be changed. But what is inspiring about their stories and seeing how far they've come and yet how far they still have to go is that the community in Boston um, rallied around them, that this act that was determined to tear the city apart and the nation apart only made everyone stronger and more unified. And I think that's really what we feel is very inspiring about their, sto about their stories and ultimately the film that you see you know, what it is to learn to walk and, and get comfortable um, with the prosthetic or um, the aftermath of uh, experiencing the, the, the marathon and suffering from PTSD. But in the end, you know, it's, it's really an up and down struggle that, that all of the survivor families are, are going through. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then I'll be back to talk more with documentary filmmakers Ricky Stern and Annie Sunberg when we come back in just a moment. Hey, folks. Do you like reading but find it's getting harder and harder to make time to curl up with a good book? Well, there's a solution. Give audiobooks a try. They're perfect for your commute to work or working out at the gym a relaxing bath, or any time, really. And right now, you can take an audiobook for a spin with a special promotion just for our listeners from audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com slash kickassnews to get a free 30-day trial and download any of Audible's 180,000 titles entirely for free. That's audibletrial.com slash kickassnews or click on the sponsor link on our webpage to download the free audiobook of your choice. And now, back to the show. I thought one of the most interesting aspects of this film is that we're used to seeing wounded warriors who come back from Iraq or Afghanistan to a wife or a husband, a parent or family member, who ends up taking on the difficult task of being the strong one in the relationship and making up for the other person's physical limitations. But in this case, what's unique is you have family members who sustained serious injuries at the same time together. You have the newlywed husband and wife, Jessica and Patrick. There's a mother, Celeste Cochran, and her daughter, Sydney. And then there are the Norden brothers, all of whom suffered serious injuries, and most of them lost at least one limb. I wonder, did they find any solace in knowing that they were going through it together? Absolutely. I think that as we were looking um, carefully at sort of who would be um, the subject of the film, how would we represent the whole of the experience, we knew we couldn't tell all the stories. But what we were hoping is that each of these families in their own unique set of circumstances would be able to open up some of that larger experience. And I think, you know, you have a family that's dealing with the invisible wounds of post-traumatic stress and trying to navigate, um, you know, the relationship as a family. And then you have this young newlywed couple who, you know, are both, they were both grievously injured and they're trying to make their lives work given that they are both struggling to recover from amputations. So it was, for us, it was important to show how the impact of these kinds of terrorist acts, these kinds of um, senseless tragedies on sort of the psyche and the spirit and what happens in those small, quiet moments when the news media goes away and you're left, um, you're left with what can often feel like unsurmountable challenges. Another unique aspect of this documentary is that it shines a light on the relationship between the victims of the Boston Marathon and members of the military who've come home with injuries. 
Um, in fact, you show a double amputee Marine visiting the bombing victims in the hospital immediately after the event to encourage them. And there seems to be a bond between the survivors and various members of the military throughout the film. Absolutely. I think for them, that's been, it's given them such, um, they, they really do feel that it's an honor to be able to be cared for and to do the rehabilitation of Walter Reed. And they have, um, they have learned and gained so much from being beside these soldiers. It's, it's incredible. And at one point, one problem the newlyweds Jessica and Patrick run into is that her recovery is taking a lot longer and it's a lot more complicated than his because there are very few doctors, apparently, with significant experience treating blast injuries in this country. So they end up going through a long process to get to be one of the rare cases of civilians to be admitted to Walter Reed Hospital, where they actually do have experts who deal with this sort of thing. Yeah, what's what's remarkable now is that um, both Patrick and Jessica are focused on new legislation that would basically um, help increase certain access and levels of trauma care for blast injuries. Given that this may be what we see more of in our country, we you know we're starting to hope that you know it, it's sort of preparing for the sad inevitability that this may happen again. And while trauma centers are amazing at dealing with gunshots and car accidents, they're not so great at dealing with debriding and, you know, and salvaging limbs and other elements that can come from blast injuries where you have so many things, you know, that rip through you and that just embed in different ways. And the surgeons at Walter Reed, that's what they're seeing. They're seeing IED injuries from Afghanistan and it's, and it's informed a lot of what Jessica is going through with, with her own care right now. You know, when I look back at the injured who came back from World War II and the Civil War, they had these limbs that were made to hide the fact that they wore prosthetics and make them look more like human limbs, but they didn't function very well. But now it seems that once we've gotten past the stigmatization, we've been able to open it up to much more effective technology and more innovative materials that have really changed the game for amputees. In fact, the mom in the documentary at one point wants to go to the beach and they give her what they call beach legs to help her walk in sand and be able to swim. Talk about some of the more recent advances in prosthetics that are allowing these amputees to regain their mobility. Yeah. Well, I think um, what's happened is uh, as a result, unfortunately, of these wars, uh, these young men and women who are in the, serving in the military um, we see more increasingly the Im the impact of IEDs and and what kind of damage those homemade bombs do to um, the body, where people are living but they're living without limbs. And so, in the past years, um, there's been a lot of um, new inventive uh, technology, yeah, to service uh, these young people because you know historically. These uh, prosthetics, prosthesis, have been made for elderly or oftentimes it's someone maybe in a car accident or diabetes. Sometimes you have to have an amputation. But they've really tried to get these young uh, servicemen and women back doing the things they love to do, whether that's skiing or yeah. rock climbing, swimming, walking down the beach. And so for um, Celeste in the film and for Jessica and Patrick, who are, who are covering at Walter Reed, um, it's they, as Annie was saying, you know, they, they feel so, so it's so important that this technology is shared with um, all people who, who suffer from an amputation. You know, it must on some level almost extend the psychological trauma for the people of Boston when they have a whole community of people, 200 something survivors with permanent visible injuries that kind of serve as a reminder of what happened that day. That must make it hard. Absolutely. I think that's the other issue, too, though, with people who have had, in some ways, the, the emotional and the mental health issues, the fallout that can happen when you know, something like this happens to a community. You don't see them. You don't know to think that they might be hurting. It can be quite destructive for an individual and for their family. And it's also led to a bond among the victims. They attend each other's family events. In the film, you see just about all the amputees attending one of their weddings. It seems that they've formed a pretty tight bond. 
they have deep, deep, deep close relationships. I mean, I think it's like any anything that you go through, a crazy experience, you know, traumatic experience like that, and it's a shorthand. They all they all know what they've gone through. They they trade information. They help support each other. Um, they might refer each other to different prosthetic place, places. They also just get together and enjoy each other. I think um, you know, as Pat, as Jess says, when JP gets married, when somebody has a high moment, they're all celebrating because they know how hard won those moments are, and. Um, you know, and they're all so different. You know, they, they come from incredibly disparate backgrounds. And, you know, the fact that this is the reason for their friendship, um, I think, I wish you had seen the banter between JP and Patrick at the screening in Boston on Tuesday night because they can give each other shit in the best ways. And it's, <laughs> and it's really remarkable and great to see. And many of them attended the trial and testified against Zokar Sarnayev. Did that bring the victims any sense of closure or satisfaction that they had the chance to confront their attacker? I think it was mixed, you know, from our perspective and, and just focusing on these three survivor families, I think you have a mixed opinion. Um, Liz Norton says in the film that it, it gave her a sense of satisfaction that, that justice had been served, but um, she would not have, would say that, it, I don't think she would say that it brought her closure uh, I think she still wonders and 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 uh, considers what happened unfair, um, even though, as she said, you know, it's you know, it's there is no making sense of it. Um, so I think it's really mixed. Uh, I, I think the trial was uh, har very hard for some people. Yeah, I think the timing of the trial was particularly hard because it came two years after the bombings, and it literally was that April of 2015. And I think for some people, you know, the physical rehabilitation was continuing, but emotionally people were starting to kind of be in a different headspace, and then it just opened things right up again. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, in particular, I think for Jessica, a very hard, uh, hard experience to testify. Although Massachusetts is not a death penalty state, it was a federal case, and Zokar Sarnayev did receive the death penalty. Where did most of the victims stand on this issue of whether he should be executed or not? It's hard to know for the larger survivor community. Mm -hmm. We can really only speak in some ways for the people who participated in our film. I know for there was, you know, for the people who had really conflicting emotions um, and philosophies about the death penalty, it was also a very difficult trial. Um, Massachusetts is a state with no death penalty. It became a federal case that brought the death penalty back into the state. Um, this was, there were certain reasons in the criminal code that they were able to charge Jahar Sarnayev with the death penalty and the federal prosecutors made that part of their, you know, that was their choice. That was their agenda. I don't think in general, most people in Massachusetts are pro death penalty. I think for people who were hit by this, um, it stirred up certain feelings that they wanted to see it justice. I think in our film, everybody speaks to it. Liz speaks very clearly to it. Celeste speaks clearly to it. Jess and Pat have their own views. The Boston Globe gave the Richards a format, you know, for them to share their op-ed, their thoughts. And I think that, um, you know, the survivor community was really split on it. But in some ways, we were talking about this early, earlier today. We now live in a country that is so politically divisive, where there is so much partisanship that it has been truly um, inspirational to watch these families with very, very distinct and different views on the death penalty have a respectful conversation about what it means for each of them. And of course, life goes on. We've now had, uh, I think, three marathons since the bombings. What has the mood been like at the Boston Marathons in the years since the bombing? Well, it's funny. I, we, there was a screening last night on Nantucket Island, which is a small island in Massachusetts that's sort of within the Boston orbit. And there were two people there who were runners who, you know, they they participated last year and everybody was bemoaning. It's like innocence lost. It's this idea that what used to be this incredibly inclusive celebration of a day, people had the day off from work, you know, people, they used to call them, what was the name? If you just jumped in and you broke ranks, just ran the Boston marathon as what's it called? A, I forgot what that's called. It's not like a pirate or something or a bandit. I think they're yeah. called bandits. The people used to just jump into the marathon and run it and they didn't have an official number. And that's gone now. Yeah. And I think that there is just um, kind of a psychic sadness that our society is changing for that, you know, in that way. Well, again, the documentary is called Marathon, The Patriots Day Bombing, and it airs on HBO Monday, November 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern. Ricky Stern and Annie Sunberg, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks again to Ricky Stern and Annie Sunberg for joining me via Skype. 
Marathon, The Patriots Day Bombing, airs tonight, Monday, November 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern on HBO. And you can also watch anytime with a subscription to HBO Go or HBO Now. For more information, visit HBO.com. You can learn more about Ricky and Annie and their previous work at BreakthroughFilms.org and follow them on Twitter at at RicksterStar and at Annie Sunberg. And once again, before you start your Amazon shopping this Christmas, visit the sponsor page on our website at kickassnews.com and copy our Amazon link into your web browser first. Then Amazon will kick us a little coin for every order you make this season. Be sure to subscribe to Kickass News on iTunes and leave us a review while you're there. You can visit Kickass News on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at, at KA Politics. And please be sure to recommend Kickass News to your friends on your social media. And if you really want to help out, then donate to our GoFundMe campaign at GoFundMe.com slash Kickass News. As always, I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at KickassNews.com. For now, though, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass News. Kickass News is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.